I'm back from my first in-person pastor's conference that I've been to in nearly two years. Um, I uh, was in Chicago with a couple of pastor friends of mine last week at the annual conference for the Center for Pastor Theologians, uh, mostly a reformed group of pastors, and uh, got back late Thursday night. I'm glad to be back with you today. Uh, You know, two weeks ago, um, I was invited to speak at the 50th anniversary of the very first church that I pastored. And uh, it was um, an unexpected invitation, and I was able to go, and uh, it was a healing time because my last year at that church was a very painful year for me. This was my home church, the church that I started attending during my first year of college right after I came to Christ. And then after I graduated from seminary, um, when I was 28 years old, this church, in a very unconventional decision, called, <clears throat> called me to be their new pastor when I was 28. So to say that I was underqualified would be an understatement. Um, I had no pastoral experience Um, especially at a larger church with several staff members. The youth pastor was seven years older than I was. And six months earlier, he had been my boss, and now I was supposed to supervise him. And so let's just say the learning curve in those first few years was very steep. And during those first couple of years at that church, whenever I would get together with the other pastors in the city um, for, you know, ministerial association or prayer breakfast and things like that, I was always the youngest pastor in the room. And so I eventually got used to being in that role, the inexperienced young pastor um, of the church and the community that was kind of figuring it out as he went. But then it seems like I blinked, and I suddenly found myself one of the older pastors in the room. And I can't pinpoint exactly when it happened, but I gradually started noticing that more and more of the pastors that I was meeting were younger than I was. Um, I left that church after being there for um, about 17 years and eventually joined the pastoral team at Azusa Pacific University, and that's where I really noticed it. Um, Because at APU, I was the oldest member of a five-person pastoral team. Um, And even at that conference I was at um, in Chicago, I was there with two of my pastor friends from a previous church, um, and they kept referring to me as the older statesman of our group. Now, this transition from being the young, inexperienced pastor to being the older, elder statesman caught me off guard. Um, And so at first I was surprised when younger pastors started coming to me for advice because they thought somehow because I was older I had some kind of wisdom I could um, give them. But does being older really make a person wise? What exactly does it mean to be wise? The dictionary definition of wisdom is the practical application of knowledge. It's possible to know a lot of things, but not know how to apply the things that you know. It's been said that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable, but wisdom is knowing not to put tomatoes in your fruit salad. When I was 28 years old, I knew a lot of things, but it took years of ministry to experience to figure out how to apply those things. In everyday life. And even now, this is my 30th year of pastoral ministry. I still make mistakes. I still learn new things and still struggle to try to figure out how to apply the new things that I learn. Today, we're going to talk about how our faith in Jesus can help us become wiser no matter how old we are, whether we're young or old. Now, we've been in this series through the Bible's book of James called Faith Work. And in this series, we've been looking at how to put our faith to work in everyday life. And our Faith Work small groups are also back on this week. Your small group study guide you can get at the little bistro table under the the, um, tent out on the patio for the next three weeks. And in this series, we've talked about putting our faith to work during hard times when we face temptation. And then two weeks ago, we talked about putting our faith to work in how we use our words. Today, we're going to talk about putting our faith to work with wisdom. 
In James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, we're going to find four characteristics of the kind of wisdom that an authentic Christian faith will produce. So, um, would you stand with me? I'm going to read the entire text. Stand with me if you're able for the reading of God's Word. This is James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. It's the Word of the Lord for us today. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility, the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such, quote, wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. You can be seated. This is not the first time that James has talked to us about wisdom. Back in chapter 1, verse 5, James encouraged us that when we're going through hard times in life to ask God for wisdom and that if we ask God in faith, God will give us the wisdom we need in order to navigate those hard times. But now here in chapter 3, James warns us that there are two different kinds of wisdom. One that comes from God and one that doesn't. And James wants to make sure that we're seeking after the right kind of wisdom. Apparently, some of the people in the church James wrote to were bragging about their wisdom and understanding. And so just as James challenges people who claim to have faith to show their faith in their deeds, here he claims though, here he challenges those who claim to have wisdom to show their wisdom by their way of life. If we want our faith to lead us to the right kind of wisdom, we need to start by looking at wisdom's origin. Is it from above or from below? Above or below. James uses this spatial image in verse 15 and again in verse 17 to contrast two different kinds of wisdom. God's wisdom that comes from heaven and this other kind of wisdom that comes from below. This wisdom that comes from below is a counterfeit kind of wisdom. And James uses three adjectives to describe it. Earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. The, the three adjectives that James uses are the rough equivalent to what the rest of the Bible calls the world, the flesh, and the devil. Counterfeit wisdom looks like real wisdom. But it comes from our society's hostile opposition to God, from the world, it's earthly. It emerges from corrupt human nature, from the flesh. It's unspiritual. And it's inspired by dark, evil forces. The devil or it's demonic. God's wisdom comes from above as a gift from God. But counterfeit wisdom comes from below, from the world, the flesh, the devil. People of faith will want to make sure that they're pursuing the right kind of wisdom in their lives. The wisdom that comes from above. And so how do we find the right kind of wisdom? I think the Bible points us in a couple of different directions. We find God's wisdom in the Bible itself. 2 Timothy 3.15 in the Bible says that the Bible is able to make us wise for salvation. The Bible is, a, is an unlimited fountain of God's wisdom. And I'm not just talking about the wisdom books like Proverbs or, or Job or Ecclesiastes. I'm talking about the entire Bible is saturated with God's wisdom, which is why we prioritize the Bible here at Glenkirk. It's why I teach from it. It's why our small groups are studying the Bible. Because it's a source of wisdom. But we can also find God's wisdom in creation as well. The Bible itself says in Proverbs 3.19 that God created our world with his wisdom. 
which means that God has imprinted his wisdom in the created world around us. You might picture a piece of wood. God's wisdom in creation is like the wood grain on a piece of wood. The wise person lives with the grain of God's wisdom in creation instead of living against the grain. And we can discover the imprint of God's wisdom in creation by looking closely and studying creation. It's because of the imprint of God's wisdom in creation that, that humans are able to do science and technology and find ways to treat diseases and create vaccines and develop technologies that make life better. It's because of the imprint of God's wisdom that we discover better ways to lead organizations and cultivate healthy marriages and raise our kids and so forth because of the imprint of God's wisdom in creation. We discover that imprint by looking at creation and then by learning to live with the grain of God's wisdom in creation. But then we find the fullness of God's wisdom in Jesus himself. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 24 that Jesus is the wisdom of God. In Colossians 2 3 it says that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus. His life, his death, his teachings, his example are the perfect embodiment of the wisdom of God. So the wisdom that comes from above is found in the Bible in creation and in its fullness in Jesus himself. If our faith is going to lead us to become wise, we need to look at wisdom's origin and make sure we're looking for the right kind of wisdom. Another way to distinguish God's wisdom from counterfeit wisdom is its motive, humble purity or boastful ambition. Humble purity or boastful ambition. In, in verse 13 of our reading, James says that God's wisdom leads to humility. The ancient Greeks believed that humility was a weakness, something to be avoided at all costs. And many people in our culture today agree with the ancient Greeks. But the Bible presents humility as something that's good for us and good for life. A trait that's essential to living the Christian life. In, in C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, Lewis at one point talks about the fact that pride causes people to always look down in life. Down at the world, down at organizations, down at other people. And they never look up. That humility is what causes us to look up and to see God above us, to see the world, to see other people and our relationship to it. And as we look up, that generates humility in our lives. In verse 17, God says, James says that God's kind of wisdom is first of all pure. This word pure is often used in the Bible to describe a heart that's free from mixed motives. A heart that's free from hidden agendas. The, the rest of the list in verse 17 describes the outworking of purity in heart. And so if you put humility and purity together, I think you find the motive for God's wisdom is humble purity. And in contrast, counterfeit wisdom, wisdom from below, is motivated by boastful ambition. We see it in verse 14 where, where James describes this kind of wisdom as coming from bitter envy and selfish ambition. The, the Greek word for envy in verse 14 is the Greek word zelon. It's where we get our English word zealous from or zeal. This Greek word zelon describes a passionate inner disposition. And it can be positive or negative, but because James uses the adjective bitter here, he's talking about a negative, passionate inner disposition, not a positive one. And I can't help but wonder if it's significant that James uses this word, because when he wrote this letter, there was a political group called the zealots that were growing in influence. And the zealots got their name from the noun that James uses here, zealon. 
The zealots fanned the flame of outrage among their people to try to motivate them to rise up in violent rebellion against the Roman Empire. In fact, just a few years after James wrote this letter, that's what would happen. The zealots would organize and lead a violent rebellion against the Roman government that would last for four years. And during those four years of rebellion, it led to a staggering loss of life among the Jewish people. And it finally ended when the Roman army marched into the city of Jerusalem fully armed and tore down the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Many Bible scholars believe that by using the noun zealon here, James is criticizing the church's growing complicity with the zealot movement of the first century. And then there's this phrase, selfish ambition. Prior to the writing of the New Testament, this this particular word, the only other time it occurs in Greek literature before James uses it here, is in the writings of Aristotle. And Aristotle uses this word, zealous ambition, to describe ancient Greek philosophers in the 5th century who were purposefully creating divisions and factions among people in order to consolidate their own political power. Glad that, thing, that kind of thing never happens today. So how do we know whether wisdom is from God, from above, or from below? James says that the wisdom that comes from God is motivated by humble purity. It comes from an inner disposition that's free from hidden agendas or a desire to create factions or divisions. It's a wisdom that's humble, that doesn't have to force its own way or push itself to the front. But that the wisdom from below is motivated by boastful ambition that leads to dividing people. That if we want our faith to grow into God's kind of wisdom, We'll want the kind of wisdom that's motivated by humble purity. Third, we can identify God's wisdom by its effects. A life of virtue or a life of vice. A life of virtue or vice. We we don't use virtue and vice very much in our language these days. But these words describe character traits. Virtues are character traits that predispose us towards goodness. In how we live. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle said that there were four primary virtues. First, he said, is prudence, which is kind of using a skeptical reason to evaluate claims of what's true and what's not. Then there's moderation, avoiding extremes. Third, says Aristotle, is courage. And finally, according to Aristotle, comes justice, a commitment to what's right. These are often called the cardinal virtues. And many ancient Christians agreed with Aristotle's four cardinal virtues, but then they added on top of those three more. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest being God's Christ-like kind of love. Vices are character traits that predispose us away from God's goodness and a good life. Like the seven deadly sins are a great example of a vice list of pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, anger, and deceit. Now these lists aren't exhaustive. But these are inner characteristics that incline us either towards a good life or away from a good life. And the Bible is actually filled with what scholars call vice lists and virtue lists. In fact, verse 17 of our reading is a virtue list. James says it all starts with purity, which is wisdom's motive. And out of purity flow these other virtues, like being peace-loving. A a peace-loving person isn't someone who avoids conflict no matter what. A peace-loving person is someone who makes peace between people. Then there's considerate, which means treating others with respect and courtesy. Then there's submissive, which, which is not being a doormat. Or letting people walk all over you. This particular word means being willing to yield. Being open to different points of view. And willing to change our mind. Some translations translate it open to reason. Rather than always needing to be right. A submissive person is willing to consider other perspectives. Full of mercy and good fruit. Focuses on treating people mercifully. Mercifully. 
Impartial is the opposite of the favoritism we talked about in chapter 2, that, that bias and prejudice and discrimination, being impartial. And sincerity is a lack of hypocrisy. A sincere person knows they're not perfect, so they don't try to act or look perfect. They're willing to admit when they make a mistake. Now, this is not an exhaustive virtue list, but James sees these cluster, this cluster of virtues as the essential effects of God's wisdom. This is what God's wisdom will produce. In contrast to that virtue list in verse 16, James kind of lumps all the vices under this single phrase, every evil practice. There are lots of vice lists in the New Testament that we could turn to to hear what those evil practices are. Jesus in Matthew 15 talked about murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander coming from our hearts. That's a vice list. Paul's list of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5 is a vice list. You see, James wants us to evaluate wisdom by its effects. If a person claims the label wise, but their wisdom leads them to a life of vice, we can be sure that that wisdom is not coming from God. But if a person's wisdom leads them to a life of virtue, a life that is making progress towards goodness, that reveals that the wisdom that they propose does come from God. We evaluate wisdom by its effects. Lastly, James points to wisdom's relationships. Peacemaking or dividing. Peacemaking or dividing. Verse 17, the last verse in the chapter says that peacemakers who plant peace or sow peace will reap a harvest of righteousness. This echoes the words of Jesus who said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Peacemakers are people who bring people together, who seek reconciled relationships between people instead of feeding into resentment that leads to splintered relationships. And in contrast to that, verse 16 says that counterfeit wisdom leads to disorder as well as every evil practice. Disorder is a strong word. It implies the, the chaos that comes to a community in rebellion against each other. It describes an entire community that's in a chaotic uproar, usually because bad actors are stirring it, motivated by a hidden agenda. It's an appropriate way to describe what the zealot movement was in the time James wrote this letter. We can find God's wisdom where peacemakers are working to bring people together and restore relationships. The wisdom that comes from this world tears people apart, leads to chaos and disorder. Instead of peacemakers sowing peace to reap a harvest of righteousness, counterfeit wisdom sows division to, reach, to reap a harvest of chaos. When I read this, <clears throat> No matter how old I am, I am reluctant to call myself wise. When younger pastors come to me for advice, I always feel tempted to, to kind of temper my advice by saying, but then again, what do I know? And it's not that I'm trying to look humble. I'm trying to be honest. Because I don't think becoming a sage, a person known for their wisdom is something that a person can declare themselves to be. Wisdom is a gift from God that's affirmed by other people, not an achievement that we take upon ourselves. And today, James has pointed out that there's more than one kind of wisdom. There's God's kind of wisdom, wisdom from above, the, the kind of wisdom we find in the Bible and in creation and, and most in its fullness in Jesus. But there's another kind of wisdom out there. The kind that comes from society's rebellion against God. From the dark recesses of human nature. And inspired by the demonic realm. And it's this counterfeit wisdom that was threatening to tear the church apart when James wrote this letter. 
It was this counterfeit wisdom that was fueling resentment that would explode in violence in the, the zealot rebellion just a few years after James wrote this letter. And the zealot rebellion would not only lead to a staggering loss of life, but it would seriously damage the church's testimony to the Roman world. A faith that works is a faith that cultivates the right kind of wisdom, motivated by humble purity instead of selfish ambition, that leads to a life of virtue instead of vice, that leads to peacemaking in its relationships. And when we're confused about which kind of wisdom we might be encountering as we go through our life, we can discover its origin by, by evaluating its motivation, its effects, and the kinds of relationships it fosters. James challenges us to show our faith by our action and to show our wisdom by how we live our life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these words from James that are challenging words for all of us. No matter how old we are, Lord, we admit that we have much room to grow into developing the kind of wisdom that comes from above, the kind that's a gift instead of an achievement, the kind that furthers your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that you are the fount of all true wisdom. You are the wise God who has revealed your wisdom to us by giving us the gift of your word, by imprinting your wisdom in your creation, and by sending Jesus in whom are hidden all the fullness of wisdom and knowledge. So Lord, we turn to you to lead us, to guide us into the kind of life that we might live. God, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand again.